Today I want to tell you what physics says about biology. There are many questions that we'll be able to ask and get answers to. For example, why are mice stronger than elephants? What is it that determines the lifespan of animals and of course humans as well? What determines the rate at which we burn up energy, metabolism and so forth? Well, physics and biology seem to be two totally different subjects. So when we studied these in school, physics was about balls and springs and levers and flow of fluids, electrons, atoms, molecules, etc. All inanimate things. And yes, they were simple and so therefore you could get formulae from them and those formulae had a lot of power to them. So if you understand how a certain formula is derived, you can then apply it. And so, for example, at this very moment, there are five spacecraft circling Mars. And we launched them from Earth knowing just Newton's laws of motion and Newton's law of gravity. And that was enough to make them land precisely millions of miles away. We didn't need quantum mechanics. We didn't need Einstein's theory of relativity, just Newton's laws, which are 400 years old. So it's very nice, very precise, and biology is exactly the opposite. Biology is about living creatures, about living things, things that reproduce themselves, things that keep changing with time. And they don't seem to be simple principles over there. And so when we read biology in school, you have to learn these diagrams, you have to learn these facts and then facts, and there doesn't seem to be anything correlating them. But then a lot of very great minds started thinking that maybe there is a connection. And the first one was Galileo Galilei, about the time of Newton, actually just before him. Galileo asked the question, what determines the robustness, the load carrying capacity, the strength of animals? Now actually it's a very interesting question because one thinks that bigger animals are stronger. So for example, an elephant can carry a huge amount of weight it was used therefore for fighting wars with. We use donkeys to carry weights and we think the donkey is a strong animal. But actually the stronger animal, stronger than the donkey or the elephant, is the ant. The ant can carry several times its weight. Now here is how Galileo approached the problem. He did it just like a physicist does. So he said, the thicker an animal's legs are, the more weight they can bear. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. If you look at a fox, well, the fox weighs only 5 kilograms, whereas an elephant weighs 6,000 kilograms. The fox's bones are smaller, but not very much smaller. So why is this? Following Galileo, he said that the strength of a structure, that is to say the amount of load that it can bear, depends upon the cross-sectional area of the pillar or the leg. So if we call the cross-sectional area A, and we use this pillar, which could be a leg. Well, let's say that its area is one unit and its weight is one unit also. Now, suppose I increase all the dimensions of this pillar or leg twice. So I'm doubling all these lengths. The area now increases by four units because the area is the length into the length, so length squared, and so doubling the length has 
increase the area by four units, but the weight is proportional to the volume and the volume goes as length into length into length, that is length cubed, and that increases the weight by eight units. Okay, now let me triple the lengths. Now the area has increased from the original one unit to nine units, and the weight has increased from the original one unit to now 27 units. Now here is Galileo's assumption. He says the strength of the structure is proportional to the cross-sectional area, that is to say L to the power 2. However, the weight of the structure, let's call that M, increases as the third power of L. Now obviously, if M is proportional to L cubed, then L is proportional to M to the power one-third. Now let's take the ratio, the strength of the structure divided by the weight of the structure. Well, that's proportional to L squared divided by L cubed, and that's proportional to one over L. But I've just argued that L is proportional to m to the power one-third. And so the strength of the structure divided by the weight of the structure goes down as one over the mass to the power one-third. So here's the prediction. The weight-carrying capacity of an animal decreases as the one-third power of the animal's weight M. So you see, this is why the ant is so strong and it can carry so much more than its own weight. It also tells you, this reasoning, why humans cannot fly. We're just too heavy for that. So the heavier you are, the weaker you are. And in fact, this is why dinosaurs couldn't fly either, although they seem to be so strong. Okay, now let me come to another question that physics helps us understand about living creatures, and that is, how much food do we eat? How much does this animal and that animal and that animal eat? So let's look now at the metabolic rate, that is the production of energy. This is a question that was actually answered not by Galileo, but by a very famous biologist about a hundred years ago. His name was D.R.C. Thompson. And here is his argument. For any living being, the production of heat, that is to say the metabolic rate, that is exactly equal to the radiation of heat from the surface. Because if it was not, well then, so suppose we produce more heat than we radiate it away, then we'd get hotter and hotter and die. On the other hand, if we didn't produce enough heat, then we'd get colder and colder and we'd die. And so exactly the radiation from the surface must equal to the heat generated from within the body. Okay? The radiation of heat from the surface depends on how much surface we have. In other words, the surface area. But the surface area is proportional to L squared. And now you remember that L is proportional to m to the power one-third. Therefore, the rate of production of energy, the metabolic rate, is proportional to m to the power two-thirds. If you take the ratio of the food consumed divided by the body's weight, then that is m to the two-thirds divided by m, which makes it one over m to the power one-third. And so that's telling you that bigger animals consume proportionately less food than smaller animals. Look, the answer is understandable because the more surface you have, the more you radiate. And once you take the ratio with the body weight, then you can see immediately why a mouse 
has to eat so much and an elephant has to eat so little. Okay, so now what we've arrived at is that the metabolic rate is proportional to m to the power two-thirds. And two-thirds is 0 0.67. So does this formula work well? It's not bad, but a better formula is that the metabolic rate is proportional to m to the power three-fourths. And three-fourths is 0 0.75. Now let's see how well this works. On this graph, there are a whole variety of mammals, all the way from mouse and small birds to goats and horses and elephants. And of course, somewhere in between are humans as well. On the x-axis, you see the body mass, the body weight in kilograms. On the other axis, the y-axis, you see the amount of energy that is being produced per second, that is watts, or the energy produced per unit time. And you can see that the m to the power three-fourths law is working very well. This is something that is known as Kleiber's law, it was discovered by Kleiber in 1932. Now you could write the metabolic rate, that is the rate of production of energy, as m to the power d. Earlier on, I argued that d had to be two-thirds, and that came from the argument that uh, the heat radiated was proportional to the area. But uh, d equals two-thirds mm, doesn't work as well as d equal to three-fourths. Kleiber's law. Why? People really didn't understand until quite recently, 1996 and after that, and much of this work was done by a physicist whose name is Jeffrey West. Now, Jeffrey West used a certain kind of mathematics. It's called fractal mathematics and it's very interesting. It's a new field of mathematics and it tells you how certain mathematical structures replicate themselves. You can show that from a certain pattern you will develop identical patterns and those patterns are space filling. They will fill the whole space. But you can also understand how blood can flow in the body. So. Imagine blood flowing through the aorta, a major blood vessel. Well, that blood has to be delivered to the cells in the body, and so it happens through branches, which then make branches, which then make branches. And so, in a sense, what you have over here in the body is a fractal structure. Now, I won't go into the details, if you're interested, you can go to Google Scholar and you can look up Jeffrey West's papers and you'll see what the logic is. It basically has to do with how fluid flows in pipes, how branching takes place, and I, I don't want to get into those details. But the point is that from physics and math, you get Kleiber's law, that the metabolic rate is proportional to m to the power 3 over 4. And that's a lovely reasoning. Okay, but now let's come to something else. This is a fact that has been established by biologists over a long period of time. It says that the total number of times that your heart beats over your lifespan is 1.5 billion. Further, that this holds for all mammals. If I multiply the number of times that a heart beats per minute with the lifespan of that mammal in minutes, the answer should be the total number of heartbeats over the lifespan. And that is 1.5 times 10 to the 9. So, obviously, the lifespan is 
1.5 times 10 to the 9 divided by the heart rate. On the other hand, we've just argued that the heart rate is proportional to the metabolic rate B, which was calculated earlier. Of course, it has to be per unit mass because smaller animals will have smaller hearts, bigger animals will have bigger hearts. And the amount of energy needed by a big animal depends upon the number of cells it has, which means proportional to the volume. And so therefore, we must divide by the mass. Hence, the heart rate is proportional to m to the power 3 fourths. So that was just uh, Kleiber's law divided by m and that's m to the power minus 1 fourth. And so this gives us an incredibly nice formula that the lifespan of a mammal is proportional to its weight to the power one fourth. Now isn't this incredible that we should be just looking at the mass of the animal? We're not looking at its shape. We're not looking to see whether it has four legs or two legs. We're not looking to see if it has feathers or no feathers or whatever. So it's really quite a universal law. It's simply saying that how heavy an animal is determines how long it's going to live. Incredible. But the question is, does it work or not? So let's look at that. It does seem to be working well. A hedgehog is a small animal. Its lifespan is three years. A brown bear is a bigger animal. It lives 25 years. Humans live up till 80 years. And the bowhead whale, which is the biggest mammal we know, lives for 200 years. Well, you can always say, ah, but uh, humans, uh, why do you say they last 80 years or 100 years? Earlier on, they used to last, so about 100 years ago, the average lifespan in Pakistan, or whatever this area was, was about 40, 45 years and now it's 70 years. In other countries, it's even higher. It's 85, 90, and there are people who live for 100. So obviously, the question of how long humans live doesn't just uh, depend upon biology. It also depends upon other things like, uh, like hygiene, availability of medicines, whether you can get a COVID shot. It'll depend on that as well etc. Let's look at this in more detail. Here's a graph which shows this even more systematically. So on the x-axis, there's the life expectancy in years. You can see where the whale is, the horse is, giraffes, cats, mice, etc. And you can see again that the greater the heart rate, the smaller the lifespan. I think these results are really interesting because with rather simple ideas of physics, one has been able to understand some pretty fundamental issues in biology. And there are lots of others that can be similarly understood. So the point is that with the application of the laws of physics, you can understand many things in biology. But of course, uh, the problem is that human systems, living systems in general, are exceedingly complex. And so even if we know the laws of physics, to be able to apply them and to be able to sufficiently simplify is really the challenge. In time, this will happen. However, I must admit, I think all physicists can absolutely agree on this, that we do not as yet have anything equivalent to the Newton's laws of biology. There is no way that we're going to get the simplicity of Newton's laws of motion and gravity that will help us understand everything, but piece by piece we can get there.